Valley Fresh Fare, featuring local restaurants, their owners, chefs, and great recipes made with Yakima Valley grown ingredients. Now here is hostess, Gayla Games. Hi, and welcome to Valley Fresh Fair. We are here at the Pacific Northwest Barbecue Association Pitmaster class with Anthony James, the president. Anthony, can you tell us a little bit about what is going on today? Well, the PNWBA is putting on actually two classes. Out here we have uh, about nine barbecue teams who are learning how to cook a competition style barbecue. They're cooking pork, shoulder, brisket, chicken, and ribs. And they'll be here uh, about 12 hours all day long. And then inside the museum, we have a class of 24 students learning how to judge barbecue and uh, how to score it and be fair and eat a lot of food. Well, how did this start? Uh, the PNWBA started about 20 some years ago. Wow. Just a group of people who uh, used to cook chili and then wanted to expand out and uh, started with just a handful. And now we have about 600 members and competitions in four states and three provinces up in Canada. So Anthony, are there instructors here today that the, the team actually gets some uh, cooking lessons from? Yeah, we actually have four instructors today. They've all uh, been a champion winner and all been to the Jack Daniels Invitational Competition. Okay. We do uh, a variety of demonstrations for all the cooks and then walk around and get some hands-on hand-holding uh, with the individual teams. Well, let's hold hands and go and see what they're cooking. This sounds great. I'm here with Lene Oxley from Sugars Barbecue and Catering in Portland, and she is going to show us how to rub a pork butt. Yep, I'm going to show you. Tasty. I'm going to show you the basic principles of how you can do a championship pork butt at home on your grill. We're going to start with a beautiful, fresh, uh, Midwest-grown pork butt. Uh, this is part of the whole shoulder. This has got a lot of internal fat. This is going to, over a period of uh, time, is going to render and make some delicious, delicious barbecue. So we're going to have a really good time with this. And I'm going to show you how I kind of get this from where it's at to where it's going to go on the cooker. You've got a lot of mm -hmm. internal uh, fat in here. Right. You've got a sort of a fat cap that's on here. I'm going to help this render out with the heat and the smoke and the temperature, uh, the time. So I'm going to just score this right like this. And I'm only going about a quarter inch deep on this meat. Quarter inch. Okay. My rub, um, in this particular instance, I'm using a, 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 a prepared rub. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Barbecue Ray Lampy, big time barbecue rub. Uh, this is a great rub. It's got a lot of good salt and a little bit of sugar, uh, some cumin in it, and a lot of different spices. And you want your meat temped, room temped, before you start all of this? Or? You want it cold. Um, this, this actually just came out of the, uh, the, the cooler okay. before you guys uh, 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 came over here. And so it's cold. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rub this down. And um, you can be liberal with this. This is a large piece of meat. It's going to take a while to cook. It's going to lend itself really well to a good coating of rub. Oh, that's a great um, smelling you know, rub. Wow. Not too small a rub, and you're not going to have uh, any of that kind of mm -hmm. saltish flavor. Um, too much rub, and that's all you're going to take. So it's a careful balance, and that comes with a little bit of time and a little bit of uh, experience with this. Mm -hmm. You can have fun playing, of course, and create your own rubs. Absolutely. And... Okay, now I've seen some people are putting mustard on their pork butt even before they start with any of the uh, seasoning. Right. What's the secret? I personally don't use mustard, which is why I didn't put mustard on here. A lot of times people will use mustard on their brisket and on their pork barbecue. All this is going to do is it's going to create a tacky surface for your rub to stick to. You don't taste the mustard at the end of the cook. It, it completely dissipates and it becomes part of the, the what they call the bark on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the barbecue. And once you put it on the cooker, how many minutes or hours are we planning on this to cook? Well, again, you know, the, the, the old adage with barbecue, the basic principle of barbecue at 250 degrees is going to be um, generally about set about 70 to 90 minutes per pound. So this particular one, you know, ideally you want to cook this for about, this is going to be about a 10 hour, okay. uh, 10 hour uh, cook time. 
and this is pretty much ready to go on the cooker. So I already have one that I put on the cooker about an hour ago now, about 45 minutes to an hour so we can lift the lid uh, and we can take a look and see what that looks like. We're using one of my old bullets that I've, uh, this has traveled around the uh, country. This is a Weber Smoky Mountain bullet. The meat that's been on here has been on here uh, for a couple hours now. Uh, okay. It's just kind of starting that process mm -hmm. of barbecuing, starting that process of getting that bark together, getting that smoke. Right, you see right now, you see no smoke coming out of this. It's just radiant heat. The smoking is now done with this barbecue. This heavily smoked a little while ago. This is like a little chimney, like you see some of the other cookers going. This is what you want for the duration of the cook. If it looks like a, a train exhaust, that's not okay. That's over smoking, and that's not what you want. Mm -hmm. You want a nice blue thin uh, 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 smoke coming out of here, if at all. So this is perfect. This has been running at about 225 to 250 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for the last a, a few hours. That's the target temperature. That's what you want. Anything more, you start to grill. Anything less, you're doing a little bit of a cold smoke, and that's not what you want either. So we're going to lift the lid. We don't want to look for too long, but we're going to lift the lid and see what we got after a couple of hours. Can't wait. So now what we've got okay. here is we've got Nice we've got the pork butt that I kind of splayed out open a little bit because our time that we've got. Um, I've got the nice rub. What do you think? What does that smell like? It smells like heaven. Like you want to get, you want to <laughs> yes. start pulling it apart. Let's get the utensils, but yeah. it's a little too so early. It's not, it? obviously it's not ready right. yet, but you see this beautiful uh -huh. bark starting to form. That's what you want. Okay. And in about a few hours, I'm going to go ahead and spray this with some apple juice like I mentioned earlier. So that's what we've got going on right here. This is in, uh, this is in this good is mode just right layer now. layer that up. And, and that's the only wow. thing you want to do with it. Less is more. And if you're looking, you're not cooking. Less is i got to put this back in. Okay. Put back because we're losing temperature every single time I open this. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, the good thing about these guys is they rebound really quickly. The temperature will come back really quickly. We're talking about ribs. In the PNWBA for competition, you can cook uh, two kinds of ribs. You can either cook baby backs or you can cook spare ribs. For home and for eating myself, I actually prefer spare ribs. They have a better flavor, I think, and they have a heck of a lot more meat. Spare ribs, though, do require a bit more work to get them ready uh, for cooking. You can put them in and cook this whole thing just like this, but uh, probably not going to go over so well with the judges. There's basically three things you want to do to this. One, you want to get rid of the membrane uh, for a couple reasons. One, it doesn't cook away, so when you're eating your rib, it's going to be tough. Second, it is going to keep uh, your smoke and spices from penetrating the meat. So you want to get rid of that. The thing I learned at my first competition when I was sitting there struggling with getting the stupid membrane off, paper towel gives you the extra grip to actually grab onto that thing. Um, that made all the difference. When you cut this, what I'm going to aim for is basically pretty much a straight line so my ribs are the same length all the way across. That is a St. Louis cut. This end is going to be a little more difficult. There's a joint there in the ribs, but you're going to have to cut through it and it takes a little bit of effort. And then you've got that and do whatever you want with it. At that point, you're pretty much ready to go season it. When I cook uh, my ribs, I do mustard and I do some rub and throw them in the cooker. And that's what I do for competition and at home a lot. But actually one of uh, Christine's favorite things is actually really gooey ribs where you kind of put them on the grill and grill them and then sauce and churn and sauce and churn and sauce until that all caramelizes real nice. Bit more work, but hey, it's worth it. Also, before I season these, I'm going to give you the tip that my barbecue mentors took three years and they were leaving the state before they told me. So you can take this and you can put it on just like that and it'll cook and it'll be great. When you put it on the grill, go like that. See what just happened? Squeeze it together. When it cooks, it will actually stay that way. Now your ribs are actually thicker looking than they were when you, before you started. And then for rubbing these, like I said, just some mustard. And again, the mustard isn't really going to impart any flavor. It's just to help hold on the rub. And remember, you want to rub both sides of the pork. When that judge is taking a bite, you don't know where they're going to bite from, which also means you want to get the edges because 
if you're competing, they're only going to take one or two bites of that piece of meat, and you want to make sure that they get flavor right away. You put on ribs for about six hours, which is about how long these want to cook, they're going to think you're, uh, you're an awesome human being. Now, a lot of people, you know, they, th they think Tony Aromas or some other places and fall off the uh, bone ribs. For competition barbecue, if it's falling off the bone, it is overdone. What you want is you want it just done enough so that when you bite it, you get a nice clean bite that comes away, but the rest of the meat actually stays on the bone. So you want it tender, but you want it to still have some, uh, some texture to it, not mushy. And what I usually do is six hours on the pit, I take them off and rest them for a good 45 minutes, and then 15 minutes before I'm going to cut them, I put them back on and give them a glaze of sauce, just enough to kind of give it a shine and some nice flavor. And there is another thing you can do if you don't have a lot of room, so you want to do a dozen racks of ribs, but you don't want to mess around with a uh, rib rack or you don't have any, take this guy, roll it up, put a couple skewers through it, and it will cook no different than if it's flat. Yeah. And if you do this, you can actually fit eight racks of ribs on there, four on each level. Optimally, you want to try and cook them at 225 um, on a warm day like today. And in general, with uh, charcoal the way it is these days, you're probably going to be around 250. Um, you can bump, if you're, again, if you're pressed for time, you can bump that up to 300 and get them done faster in about four hours. What you want to shoot for is to be able to take a skewer it's called the toothpick test, and have that just kind of slide in there uh, really smoothly without any resistance. And so you just take a toothpick or a skewer and kind of put it through the meat, and if you got that, you're golden. Um, but honestly, if you put a rack of ribs on for six hours, they're going to be done. So spices, guys. If you start reading through the ingredient list on barbecue uh, spice rubs, pretty universally you'll find the same usual suspects. And they're listed here, the nine basic ingredients that you'll find either most of or all of in a spice rub for barbecue. First two are sugar and salt. And typically they're in about the same amounts, proportions. Let's talk about salt. What are the types of different different types of salts that we have access to. We have sea salt, which is, you know, salt because that's been evaporated. You have table salt, which is fine granules, and it either has iodide in it or it doesn't. I'd tell you not to use it with it, with the iodide. Don't, you know, because you don't, you don't need that chemical. There's also kosher salt. It's a coarse ground salt. You can also get, you know, like smoked salt, lemons or celery salt. I mean, there are all sorts of flavored salts. What are the different types of sugars we have? We've got regular pure grain sugar. Uh, we've got turbinado sugar, which is unwashed sugar. Uh, and you see that being used a lot in barbecue rubs because again, it doesn't burn at a lower temperature. It takes a higher temperature. This is turbinado sugar and it's, it's still brown because it's unwashed, okay? And that's you know what, what happens when they process the sugar cane. It comes out in a brown color you know, before it gets refined. You've got brown sugar. What's the problem with brown sugar? It's moist, and when you mix it in your rub, now you have something that's moist and it tends to cake. You can also order online granulated brown sugar, which is a much better uh, ingredient because it's granulator. It's not, it's not the moist brown sugar that you're used to. Typically, those are the two top items, and then you add pepper. And pepper then kind of, you think about it as kind of a triangle, salt, pepper, and sugar. That's your triangle. What you need now is some fillers, something to bind them together, and that's typically paprika or chili powder or both. Paprika in general is not a real strong flavor. What we do like it is because it has a little bit of a flavor, it kind of blends the three triangle pieces together, and it creates that barbecue red color. We all like that barbecue red color. And then of course, garlic and onion. I mean, garlic and onion go with everything. We have other kinds of, of peppers that create heat because we like barbecue sauce with a little heat, or barbecue spices. So, biggest one would be cayenne pepper. The other one would be white pepper, you know, which again, gives you that afterburn. You know, you bite into it and you don't immediately go, it's hot,
but then it's just kind of this lingering mm, heat to it. And that's where that white pepper is coming in, too. You can always make it hotter. You can't reverse that order. We're going to talk about barbecuing chicken. And the first thing to talk about barbecuing chicken is barbecued chicken sucks. Uh, just straight up. Low and slow chicken is not something that is actually good. Um, most barbecuers, once they start doing it a little while, they figure out, wait, hot and fast is still the way you want to cook chicken. Uh, it just, if you cook this piece of chicken low and slow, the skin will just turn into absolute rubber. In fact, kind of the holy grail in uh, competition barbecue, because it is so tough and everyone's got their different ways, is to try and make it so the skin is crispy. And if, you know, if you're tasting your chicken before you turn it in, you bite it and it has that, the skin is kind of rendered nice and fat and you can bite through it, it's a great feeling. When I do my chicken for barbecue and at home, uh, I cook it hot and fast. Like that uh, one that's going there is about 450 degrees. I do it in a dry pan and just two of these suckers at the top level and effectively I'm baking it as opposed to barbecuing it. There's a few ways you can cook a whole chicken. There's the ever popular beer can chicken method. What I do at home when I'm, if I'm going to make beer can chicken, I, d I don't. I will take uh, seven upper ginger ale, pour half of it out, fill it back up with Jack Daniels and shove a bunch of herbs in there and then stuck that puff with the chicken. The other way to cook uh, whole chicken, and it's actually how I cook them for a competition, is uh, what's called spatchcocking. And it's basically turning the sucker into a flat bird. Um, effectively, yeah. Best thing in the world for doing that is get yourself a pair of these. Uh, nice chicken shears. Now what I do, and it's very cathartic, let me tell you, is I'm before I cook this thing, I'm going to get it ready for doing my preparation, uh, my uh, cutting up later. So after you got it cut out, you basically you want to <laughs> you want to break the uh, breastbone so it lays flat, and you basically you can throw it in the cooker like that. And uh, usually on my bullets, I'll cook two of these. I cook them with the breast side in because the heat's coming up the outside, so the breast will cook slower. And if these get burnt. I don't really care because I'm probably not going to turn those in. Um, the other thing I do before I even uh, do any seasoning or anything is I break all these joints. That way when I am cutting it after it's cooked, the knife will go right through and I don't have to worry about trying to cut that joint. Obviously, like I said, usually this has uh, been in the brine for a few hours. Uh, apple juice, some Johnny's, a little bit of uh, herbs, things like that. Uh, I actually will take my herbs rosemary, thyme, basil, throw them in uh, apple juice and bring the apple juice to boil and turn it off and let the herbs steep and get the oils out and then dump that in with the rest of the apple juice and the chicken really absorbs all those uh, oils out of the out of the herbs. Remember it's season, season just like everything else all the meat both sides uh, even if they're not going to eat this part it's still going to help you out And, you know, you want to make sure you get underneath and all the spots. And as far as smoke on chicken, uh, most people like a fruit wood, something mild. Um, I actually like a bit of hickory on my chicken. Not a lot. A little bit of that and then mixed in with some apple or cherry. Something to give the chicken some flavor because really it's chicken <laughs> most cooks will agree chicken is actually probably the hardest of the categories over the long term you, you know get to the point where you learn here's how long you put on a brisket here's how long you put. there's a real fine line between cooked chicken and dry overcooked chicken you know you want to hit that point where it's just done when you pull it off and there's long time well uh competitive competitive teams that have turned in raw chicken because they were too far on that other side trying to uh, keep it moist. But you know, you go over that line and it's sawdust. 
yeah, if there's any one meat that you're going to temp to make sure it's done, temp your temp your chicken. And you know, we'll have cooks who get disqualified on like one piece because yeah, I temp that one, I temp that one. Oh, they're probably all done. Well, this one was maybe in the middle of the cooker, further away from the heat, and you know, judge got it, and that's the way it is. Um, we don't want to kill anybody with raw chicken. For the breast, probably about uh, one. 70 or so when I pull it because uh, it's going to come up in temp you I want to try and hit 175 to 180 in the dark meat um, for sure I put a very light thin glaze on my chicken uh, there are some cooks who do very well they will take uh, sweet baby rays and a tub of it and literally dredge that sucker through and put it in the box So anyway, tri-tip. How many of you guys have eaten tri-tip before? <laughs> That's great, because you know when I started barbecuing, I I'd never heard of tri-tip. You know, it's not something, you know, at the time it wasn't something seven years ago that you you go to Safeway and look in the cases, you wouldn't find tri-tip. Uh, very popular down in California and finally has become popular up here. Now you can go to Costco and buy the two-pack, which is where these came from, uh, without any problem. This is great for sandwiches. I love cooking up a bunch of these and, and get a big baguette and make sandwiches. Um, it, it's the sirloin part of the beef, so it's coming down from this area of the beef, um, but it is a, a tough piece of beef. It's like the brisket. It's got a, a, just a lot of big fibers going through it. So oftentimes, well, for, do me a favor. Sometimes you'll buy it and it'll have almost no fat on it. This one has almost no fat, but you can see the grains in the fat in the grains. That's great. That's what gives it the good flavor. But sometimes there'll be a big fat cap on the backside, uh, especially if you buy it from QFC sells them. Uh, and usually they've got a big, you know, piece of fat on it. And I, I will always trim those off. Um, the other thing that I will do typically is um, use a jacquard on them. You guys ever seen one of these? Some people call it a needler, and it's a jacquard. And the idea is that you're going to take it and tenderize it, beat the, you know. Now, don't do it too much because it will make it mushy. You know, you want to just kind of break it, break it apart a little bit and make it still firm. I mean, literally, I've had it, I've overbeaten it a few times and go, oh, yeah, it's tender, but it's also mush, so it doesn't have that consistency. Sometimes when you buy it from a butcher, they have already needled it. So you should ask. When you buy it from Costco, if you come real carefully, you can see little holes already in this tri-tip. They already ran it through a needler to, to tenderize it. So take a, a good look at that before you start whacking the heck out of it with your needler. I'm going to put some rub on it and we're going to let it sit for about 45 minutes and then I'm going to throw it on the grill and I'm going to caramelize it you know get a nice char on it on both sides and then I'm going to put it in the smoker for the rest of the time so you know basically taking it off direct heat and letting it slowly come up to temperature I'm going to do one of them with the lemon rub here which is my version of a kicked up lemon pepper so it's lemon pepper but it's got a lot more pepper it's got a lot of coarse um, kosher salt in it so you get that big bite to it, a uh, whole bunch of onion and garlic. The other one, I'm going to use my steak seasoning on it because, after all, it is, it's basically a steak. And you guys can try either one and see which one you guys prefer. And also, before I put it on the grill, I'm going to get, get out the olive oil and cover the whole thing with olive oil. And that way, A, it doesn't stick, and it also helps the, to get the, 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 uh, the rub nicely stuck on. I don't want to cook it to well done. I'm going to take it as soon as it gets nice and brown, I'm going to pull it off and stick it just in direct heat. You know, I'll probably just stick it inside the chamber, the main part of the smoker. I want it still to be pink in the middle. If it ain't pink, if it's gray, it's going to be a tough piece of meat, even though we've tenderized it. So you, you want to be able to get it up to, you know, I'll get it up to 135, 
degrees or so, pull it off, wrap it in a double sheet of foil, and set it aside on the smoker, just kind of on the shelf for half an hour at least. Let it get happy. After it sits for a while, then I'm going to slice it, and at the bottom of the foil, you're going to have all these wonderful juices. And the trick is to, to incorporate those juices, run all of the, the meat through the juices, okay? And to me, that's the best way of, of, of serving it. And we're wrapping it up now with the Pacific Northwest Barbecue Association Pitmaster class. What a great day it's been. We had some classified chefs here teaching us how to barbecue. And what a feast we've had. You want to be here next year for this one. Beautiful weather, fabulous food. Come see us next year. God bless. For more information on today's show, including recipes, go to kyve.org. Valley Fresh Fair is underwritten by Yakima Valley Memorial Hospital to better serve our community. And by Treetop, real fruit from real people. Thanks also to Fickle & Son Construction, Bemis Appliance, and Yakima Valley Museum.